Hello, everybody. It's Dr. John here. Uh, looks like we got people are coming on, so I'm giving it a few minutes for folks to join us there. Uh, we start right out at 7.30 and, uh, and get uh, everybody opportunity to join on the line, those who come on to the Zoom meeting, and then, of course, uh, those who uh, are watching on Facebook. And so, again, welcome. Uh, we will be finishing up on Chapter 6 tonight in Romans, and um, it's going to be a great evening for, for study. So we are in Romans until we finish it. And um, uh, so that being said, um, hey, Thomas, can you come join me for a second? Come here, please. Come here, please. I'm going to get my son over here for just a second. So if you don't mind, um, I'm waiting on, uh, on Bishop and different ones to show up, but we always start with prayer. How about, would you like to pray for us? Yes, you would. Come on, come on, come on. No? <laughs> oh, my son. I, I'm just a, I'm just a, you don't want, you should, he ran. <laughs> oh, anyway, that's fun. Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us in here. So God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you for this, the study that we're doing and understanding and learning more about you and what you did and said through the Apostle Paul when he wrote that letter to Rome, to the Christians there and also to us now today. So God, speak to us and guide us, help us to understand more about you as we journey on this path to Christ likeness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. All right, now then. Um, let me get the, uh, the this part of it started here for us. And um, one second. Oh, there's there is Frank. Frank showed up. Hello, Frank. Hey, that was up. You know, I've already prayed us in, brother. Um, I'm trying to uh, get things working here for us. Stand by. Uh, let's see. I don't know what happened to my... Mm -mm. Oh, there it is. All right. Now then, I can share the screen. I am learning more and more about this Zoom stuff than I, I don't know maybe if I like it or not. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, I've got things going here now. Um, like I said, I've already prayed us in. So you want to make any announcements or anything like that as we get started? or No, we can go right on into the teaching, sir. Well, all right, then. That's fine with me. Um, okay, so... Um, understanding Romans. I'll let you just go ahead and we'll get it kicked off there. All right, sir. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not, wait, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Because I, I printed this thing out. And okay, I will start this off. It says, understanding Romans. Chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. There is freedom to obey God, a.k.a. slavery to God. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as absolute as a reader slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of, of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of, of your natural limitations. For just as you, as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to, and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, 
So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of, of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to, leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Um, let me kind of preface uh, this information. I want to share with you something here in regards to how we study the book of Romans. We study it in, in, in order of its context. So verses six, I mean, verses 15 through 23 is a contextual part or in, in, in a better way of putting it in a paragraph of Paul's letter. So that's how we are. This is the subject matter. He deals with several subject matters and through his letters. And this one here is the contextual agreement uh, verses 15 through 23. So that's the reason why they're, they're broke up like they are. We don't actually read. Sometimes we're going to get, uh, when we actually get a little bit further on, we won't actually read like chapter, you know, whatever and verses one through whatever. We actually will start breaking things up a little bit. We'll kind of go over because remember chapter and verses didn't exist when Paul True. wrote this letter. So True. we have to keep things in the contextual understanding. And um, so that being said, um, let me go ahead and get us into this part of it. Um, what we must take notice in this portion of Paul's letter to the saints there in Rome is, is, is first that it is recognized from and in part right here from the previous verse, which is verse 14. Verse 14 says, for sins shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So sin is no longer your master. You are sin's master, okay? Because you are under grace, grace that you are saved, not you yourselves or anything that you've done. You haven't earned it. You haven't, you, you, you haven't uh, done any work that could get it. You know, it's, it's a free gift. It's something that God gives you. So, and, and you accept it. So keep in mind is that everything that from right here, from verse 15 to the end of this particular chapter, hinges on verse 14, which is for sin shall no longer be your master. Now, um, and, this, and this, when Paul writes this, it, it sets in motion the topic, which is, to set law against grace. That's his topic. He's, he's putting it out there that, that there is law and then there is grace and this, this combatancy, right? It probably surprised his leaders. Remember that these are converted Jews, the majority of them. And to be certain um, that this, this topic still kind of rubs us the wrong way even today. You know, people feel like, well, you know, I have to do certain task i have to do certain things i have to do do this right i you know i've heard it said and i guess if you 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 have been around here this planet longer than i have but have you ever heard anyone say um i'll i'll start going to church or i'll i'll be i'll get i'll see about getting saved when i get my life straightened out you, well, you i've heard that, that quite a bit yeah so i mean when i get straightened out and they never get straightened out yeah they never get straightened out it's always one thing on top of another so you know, this probably surprised the readers back then because they're in Rome. And remember in Rome, you know, Caesar put himself as a God equal to a, you know, he was God in his mind and everybody had to, you know, bow down and worship that guy. So, you know, there were things that they had to do. So in their mind, obviously this was something that was prevalent in that time or Paul mm -hmm. wouldn't have to adjust it or write about it. So it seems apparent that Paul was doing something to replace what he's doing is he's replacing the law with grace, which meant to most that he was given folks no law and therefore a freedom to sin. That's what some people want to take the other swing of the pendulum. Paul was doing something quite major, majorly different here. 
he, he wants to make absolutely sure that there is no mistake or possible misunderstanding regarding grace. And this is, you've heard, I'm sure you have people talk about, you know, greasy grace or, you know, you know, sloppy grace, or I don't know, I can't remember all the terminology they do with it. But, you know, like, well, you're just giving people, you know, a license to sin. You know, people were sinning before they ever need a license to do it. I mean, oh. so that aspect, it gets thrown out the window. Paul is obviously taking the opportunity here in his letter to reveal how to live the way God intended us to live. It's, it, it's, either, it's either good or it's bad. It's either up or it's down. It's either right or it's wrong. There is no gray. There is no middle ground. There's no place to fudge. There, the, this topic matter regarding grace, there isn't no, there's no fudging. There are only two things that masters us. It's either sin or we are mastered by the Lord Jesus Christ and him being king. Mm -hmm. it's, it's either or. You're, there is no middle ground. There is no playing around. You know, there is, there is a choice that has to be made. And it's very clear and very evident to be certain that there's one that's getting has to be required. Now, our master is the creator, okay? So that, that is beginning here in part of what he's dealing with. So we're going to pick up right on verse 15. Uh, Bishop, you want to go ahead? This verse almost repeats the question made many times previously, and even early in verse 1. Without fail, Paul answered it quite directly. Of course not. Paul develops the argument in saying that there is clearly a different, a different matter at stake a different matter at stake here. Back in verse one, he makes the challenge against the assumption that sinning will give God opportunity to exercise even more greatly the reality of his grace. Paul is guarding against something that obviously many must have been assuming. That is, since sin is no longer our master, then we can't indulge in sin anymore without inflicting fear of being controlled by it. Many feel doomed to perish eternally as a result, and that there is no way out of it. Paul will even go more deeply and securely by stating that while we are being held under the power of his grace and under his mastery in Christ, that, that this alone gives us the freedom to not sin. Any attitude that welcomes, rationalizes, or worse exercises, or worse excuses sin is not grace, but it's still slavery to sin itself. Right. So if I if I make an excuse for my sin, that's not grace. If if I if I if I rationalize in my mind that I can do this, that, and the other, which is sinfulness, that's that's not grace. If I mm -hmm. have an attitude that I can, you know, I can, you know, well, it's all right. You know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, um, and I use this, this, this analogy because it's true. You know, my natural father, um, he, he had a, he had a bad drug problem and he had the drug problem all until the, the day he died and took his last breath. Um, he got to where he had to have dialysis for his kidneys. He, he was in kidney failure. And so he would go, he would be home and he would, you know, he would take uh, enough drugs. He would just, you know, he would do cocaine. He, he did marijuana and he did all this. And his, in his mind, well, I can do all that and I'll go to dialysis. It'll clean me out. I'll be good. I'll be cleaned up. So in his mind, he thought that dialysis was the, was the savior to his body and his extremes. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong kind of that that's messed up now I, I i couldn't control it i couldn't make him stop he, he did what he did to his last dying day and um you know uh, he, he got finally got put into a coma and you know and and you know inadvertently he died because his body succumbed to all that he put his body through and in the same like manner that's kind of like what some people do in regards to sin, they, 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 they find a way to excuse it. Well, it'll be okay. 
you know, God, knows, God still forgives me. I can still do this. God still forgive me. You know, that, that's a wrong assumption. What do you guys say for it, Bishop? That's, that is a fool's errand. Hmm. The Bible said, we, I, we just read it in lesson. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Right. Yep. The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. But now red is the way, and you find there are few that travel. <laughs> my, my original pastor, it, God bless her soul, she pastored her church. She formed and pastored it for 67 years. Wow. She had, she uh, got, uh, uh, she fell into bad health at, at a younger age. And uh, she was bedridden for a while and they would bring her downstairs and she would preach from her bed. And they'd take her back upstairs to her room. Hmm. And God brought her out of it. And when she died, she, 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 well, she only weighed about 98 pounds, but she was a hundred, she was a hundred and one oh, when wow. she died, my, oh. my former pastor. And she asked a question one day from the poor, but she said, why do people sin? And when we broke and went for lunch, I sat down with her at the table, at her table, and I said, I'm going to ask you a question. She said, I said, you asked, why do people sin? She said, yes. I said, and the answer is because they like it. <laughs> they like it. They like it. You don't do things that you don't like. Yeah, true. Things I don't like, I don't, things and places I don't like, I don't fool with it, and I don't go around. Mm. People I don't care for, I don't associate with. Mm. And sin is the same thing. I don't care for sin, so I don't. I I, I can't be bothered with it. <laughs> but John, the thing the thing is this, and, and everybody listening, God gave us choice. Mm. We have a right to choose. He don't He don't force us to do anything. We are free moral agents. We can choose right from wrong. Adam had that choice. Mm. Eve had that choice. We all have the choice. To know right from wrong and to and to do right. Yes. But it's our choice. True. Very true. John? Um, let um you you bring us right into what we're looking at on verse 16. Okay. Because here's something that that everybody has to grab a hold of. Okay. And 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 that is that is that every human being on this planet. Every human being that has ever lived on this planet or who ever will live on this planet is enslaved to something. Amen. I don't care what you think. It's the I truth. It, it's, 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 it's kind of like it's, it's, it's understandable that this statement will clash with everything that you've been taught in religion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there are those teachers who, who can, who say you can live any way and God will understand. Sadly, there are even some group of believers who have erroneously believed that everyone gets to inherit eternal life no matter what. That's a what lie. You do. It's, and neither one is true. Now, my statement was, is that they're, everybody's enslaved to something. Verse 16 says, do you not know that if you, are, you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. That's right. Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, again, there are some who truly believe that all roads lead to God. No matter what the road is, whatever what religion that is, mm -hmm. every road goes to God. Mm -hmm. All of these and even others are very heretical beliefs and absolutely goes against Scripture. Why do these statements clash with those who who call out our independence? They 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 it clashes with what we call independence. In fact, this statement that all humans are enslaved to something will absolutely go against the 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 will of free will, if you please, and 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 that is what you know what we call it free will. But the fact remains that even though we were created for independence, you and I are still slaves to whomever or whatever we commit ourselves to. 
whatever we commit ourselves to obey. For example, you may choose to obey erroneous doctrines, okay, or obey false teachers, or obey yourself, or your own selfish motives and your own selfish ambitions. You, you will choose to, or you can choose to obey God. What this means is that all of your friendships, all of your employments, all of your goals, all of your citizenships, uh, all of your memberships, even your educational pursuits, um, all your careers, all your all the marriages, all our families' life, uh, and even our debts will all be included in every instance, and in some cases, and combination of these things, are some type of form of slavery. Hmm. All of these, we might say, are a part of normal function. Of, you know, that's just how we normally function. Or that's our, just our normal everyday lifestyles. But no matter what you think or what you consider, no matter how hard you try to explain them away, they master your time, your energy, your pocketbook, your life, your dreams, your hopes, everything. It masters. Something masters us. Okay? However... When sin is your master, you have no power but to change its mastery and control. And until you do that, you're under its control. And it will do its bidding. It will cause you to do everything it wants you to do. In the end, sin will bring death. And not just a physical death, quite an eternal death. However, when we choose to choose God in order to obey him, we come into an alignment with him who created us. And all the while, from the time of our dedication, that we start believing in Christ, that we commit ourselves to him, we identify with him, when we become slaves again, okay, that's what we're doing. But this time we are slaves to the obedience to the will of God. And our will becomes his will. And at that moment, we will then receive God's approval, kind of, is what Paul states in this verse. And isn't that good news? Isn't that good news that we can, you know, we can, when we come and commit ourselves to Christ, that there's something that, that happens as a result from making that choice. But we must also understand that there are only two choices and no, no, no middle ground to choose from. I have a comparison, John. Go ahead, brother, please. And as you were speaking earlier about being slaves and what controls us, couldn't we say that our job is our slave master? Can be. Okay. Because it controls when you come to work, when you go home, mm -hmm. how much you make, mm -hmm. how long you work, mm -hmm. uh, when you take a vacation, yep. when you can do whatever you, uh, whatever you need to do. Your job is your master because it controls what you do. It does. Yeah. Until until you reach the age where you can say, "Look, enough of this, and I'm, I'm gone." <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, now, for those of you who want to say, "Well, now wait a minute, I've got to work. I've got to supply for my family." Absolutely, absolutely. But have you committed your job to Christ? Mm -hmm. Hello. Did you have you committed your functionality that what that is that you do on a daily basis? Have you given that to God? I'm thankful that I have a job. Well, that's one thing. Okay, got it. But did you take that one thing and say, God, I know this, you gave me this job. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you're grateful. But did you give it back to him? No. See, that's the thing. We sl we, we we become slaves because it becomes a taskmaster. Consider the slaves of Egypt and how they existed. Pharaoh at Moses' time, okay, the Pharaoh that came up at that time when he looked to slay all those children, all those babies, that guy, did. the Bible says he didn't know who Joseph was. He, no, had no, he, didn't. he didn't remember Joseph. He was, this was, time had passed to the point to where the goodness of what Joseph did to to get everybody through the drought and through those those terrible times, you know, it, that just kind of just went away. 
you know, it didn't, didn't keep didn't keep that in his mind, and and because he 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 feared what Israel could become because they just kept multiplying. The more more the more pressure he put on them, it seems the more they multiplied. Hmm. Can I say that that you that when you are in Christ, your multiplication factor gets exemplified and gets multiplied even greater exponentially all because of the pressure that gets put upon you we do better when we are at our worst Mm. we absolutely are able to get through more things i well god won't put on me no more than i can withstand and all of a sudden next thing you know you know you're going through something like i can't stand this well yeah you can or you wouldn't be going through it god saw more in you than you saw in yourself. But when we look towards the taskmaster, they they took away the, the means to, to make more of, 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 the, of the bricks. They, 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 they kept them making more bricks, but then that wasn't enough and they killed the babies. I mean, the fact is, is that those taskmasters that overwhelm us and take control of us, have you given that to God? Because if you had, then even though you're working for this guy, that guy is your boss. And we exist in our lives and we live day to day. We function because we're not looking to please the taskmaster. We're looking to please our creator. That's the difference. So before you start you know, saying, well, no, yeah, but I've got to work. Yes, absolutely. I got to work too. I work a job just like a lot of people do. I supply for my family just like everybody else does. That's not the issue. The point is, is that are you working for the guy or are you working for him? Do you get up and you go to work and say, God, Lord, you, this is your day. I've got to go do this. So if there's anybody you want me to meet up with or, or see or, or express the kingdom or show your love towards them, you know, Put them in my path, God. This is, this, this, you know, this, uh, that job is, you gave me that job. So that job is yours. So I give it back to you. This is the difference. But we're, but everybody is some, is a slave to something. You're either a slave to sin or you're, a, or you're a slave to God. Mm. In fact, Matthew 6 24, where Jesus talked about that no one can serve two masters. You're either going to love the one or you're going to hate the other. There, there's no riding the fence there to be clear there there is a result in mastery in his mastery it's the reality of life and life exponentially life righteously life holy but when you are a master your mastery is sin then you are no longer going to experience those good things that comes your way you know, I, I hear it every every day. I hear it, and there are those of you who are watching, who have looked out to me and reached out to me for money, right? Well, I, I I've got this orphanage, or I've got this this, you know, I've got this school, or I've got this ministry, and I've got this, and I, I need you to sow into my into my ministry. Well, I could say the same thing to you. Why don't you come sow into my ministry? You know, I don't ask. You, no one. I have never asked for anybody to give me money. When I go preach, they, they try to take up an offering, I, 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 I stop it. When they try to say, well, here, this is what we took, you know, no, I, I, won't, I won't accept it because freely I received and freely I give. It ain't about that money. That's not, that's not the reason why I went and spoke. I, I went to speak to set captives free, to help those to, to be liberated, to help those to gain wisdom, to help someone to understand more knowledge, to help some, I, I don't know everything. Thank God for it. I mean, I, you, I, there's a lot of questions I can't answer. I don't know I, all, everything that's in that book, but I do know who wrote it. And I answer to him and God lets me know when I need to speak and he lets me know when I need to be quiet. So e- either sin is your mastery or you know, how about this? What, Frank, what about this? Do you think that, is it possible? Just a question. So it just crossed my mind. 
is it possible that religion can be your master? Yes. So it, why don't you, how? Let's talk about that. Okay, I, I'm glad you asked. There are some people who, who take religion literally, as most of us should. Then there's some folk who take it literally and go, go to the point where, where they become fanatical with it. They obsess with it, and that's wrong. When you become, when religion is an obsession, everything coming to my is religion, 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 religion. Even the Bible says, as far as Christ said, I will not dwell with man always. Mm. Well, you cannot stay in religion, in, in your religiosity. Let me put it that way. 24 seven and not go nuts. And I hate to put it so blunt. But if you become obsessed and, and you become fanatical with religion, everything you everything that you look at, you equate it to religion. There's something wrong there. Where's reality? Hmm. What would be you an know, what would, where's what would be truth in here? What would be an example of that, Frank? Oh, well, let's say that every time somebody says, every time John, the Lord told me to tell you, and, and that, that's today. I may not see you no more until next week. John, you know what? The Lord, this one just told me to tell you. There's something wrong with that. Hmm. God don't speak to people like that. Hmm. Or every time you look around, they, they will beat you to death with scripture, trying to hammer it into your head that you have to do this, you have to do that. And that's not the way God works. Hmm. He said, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Mm. Loving kindness. Mm. I don't, I'm not going to beat you up with the word because it's sharp enough as it is. <laughs> it is. It, if it can divide the soul and the spirit and, and the mouth from the bone, you think it ain't sharp? Mm. True. Can I say? Very true. So, so it, it could be things like... Um, um, and for example, I, I, let me try to answer my own question in an in, in experience that I've had. Um, I was at a church one time, ministering at a church, and um, the there was this young child, I don't know, the, the kid could have been three or four years old, and, uh, you know, just a toddler, mm -hmm. and this kid um, decided to go across the stage or the platform behind the pulpit. And when this kid ran across stage, I mean, I bet you at least four mothers, a couple of deacons and the pastor attacked that child. Okay. I mean, you know, you know, snapping fingers and clapping hands and, and just, and hollering at the child and the child just stopped and, you know, put the finger in the mouth and like, you know, you know, and, and, and they were screaming at this child. And all of a sudden this child started crying. Well, I reached down and picked up the child and stopped the child from crying. And it's okay. It's okay. And they all said, you can't be running across that stage like that. That's God's stage. And I, I, I looked at that woman. I said, oh, ma'am, the whole world is God's stage, if that's what you want to say. But uh, uh, this, this poor little child don't understand that. And the, the father came up and I handed the child to the father. And the father looked at me and he said, thank you for that. And now I don't know what become of it, but they berated that child, this little toddler, because this child ran across the stage that they, they worshiped that, that stage more. They cared more about that stage than they did the child. Instead of taking the child and, and just, you know, just the child's too young to understand something like that. Yeah, we're not supposed to walk across the stage. How does a three-year-old know what a stage is, you know? Uh, the, you you have you have berated that child and caused a mark on that child and now this child is going to grow up you know what happens if that child it, it, it left enough mark in that child to never want to every time it sees a stage in a church that it doesn't even want to go what if what if that child grows up to be a a 19 year old kid who just graduated school and starts you know experiencing drugs and 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 alcohol and and you know friends causing them to go down the wrong path 
And you know the right path is to walk in fullness of God and the creativity of righteousness. Yet, you know, every time in their mind, maybe possibly, you know, you've sowed enough seed, fear is a terrible tactic and should never be used in, in God's house. The, the fear and reverence of God, but not fear in somebody else to 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 berate them or to to create or be doing what I call fear mongering. I mean that you you can't you can't do that and expect a child to, you know, embrace Christianity. Oh, I really want this. You're going to chew on me all the time. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, sure, you know. Let me throw a wrench in the game. Do what? Let me throw a wrench in the game. Go ahead. Throw on. What happens when you take a child three to five years old and, and baptize them? They don't know why they're getting wet, and they don't, they don't know the meaning of baptism. <laughs> right. Again, that's religiosity. You're, that's a great example. That's a great example. Um, and, 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 and what do you do? Do you hold the child under to the bubbles? Quit, I mean, what, I mean come on. <laughs> well, there's going to be a reality check here somewhere. Now, oh, I know there's going to be those preachers who's going to come at me and say, well, you shouldn't speak against baptism or you shouldn't speak against, you know, the, you know, not, somebody not respecting the house of God. Well, last time I checked, even, even Paul addressed the reality of prayer when he went to, when, when he went, had to go to Jerusalem and deal with, with James and, and, and Peter and, and, the, and those guys, when they were talking about, you know, you know, praying towards Jerusalem and he said, Hey, wait a minute, we are the temple of God, you know? So, I mean, you know, there comes a time when our grammar has to be corrected. So, um, anyway, uh, verse 17, brother, go ahead. I'll let you have that. However, before we accept the salvation that God offers through Christ alone, do not get too big-headed because all believers were slaves to sin. Now we have, as believers alone, can now we, as believers alone, can have a brand new master, because we have obeyed the new teaching, as Paul tells us here, from God, and this is referring to the good news message. Yes, we were sinners before we became new creatures, dealing with error each and every day of our lives on this earth. But then, the eternal reality that is firmly established in, in what Christ did on the cross, and upon that mercy seat, in the eternal happened and everything old passed away and everything became new aren't you glad i am so glad yes i am so glad no it doesn't mean that we can just live any old way we would want to do or in a sinful state it simply means that the eternal aspect is set as long as we are set in our hearts and obey him I do not know of anyone that has ever regretted obeying God or regret falling in love with Christ. When we fall in love with Christ, we must also understand that his first, that he first fell madly in love with us. And usually that is what breaks the old flesh heart. Whenever you see it, I, I've seen it. I know you have, you talked about it, you know, seeing somebody who just, just you, the, the weeping begins, they, they start recognizing the reality of, you know, that God does love them and, and they start responding. You see it in their remorse, in their, mm. in their disturbance of their emotions. You see it. You can feel it too. Oh, sure you can. So, so what, so what happened was how the message of Christ's actions is what it is. When you recognize the reality of, 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 of what took place in 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 on that cross and on the reality of what he did in the mercy seat the how god took authority over sin because he became sin what it, happened is you got a reality check and you became godly sorry key, correct key 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 word godly sorry amen this yes, is where repentance can comes in that's right that's right so Paul's message here is really, that's what he's saying. You know, I mean, the verse itself, verse 17 says, thanks be to God that although you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. Right. To that form of teaching to which you were all committed. So we have to grasp the reality that there is, there, there is this, this remorse that happens within us. 
there is a a a a, a diligence that that gets risen within us that we seek to pursue God and we 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 fall in love with the idea that this that God who the creator of the universe loved me so much that he that he suffered a a, a death even the death of a cross from from me he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him God mm -hmm. had a plan you know what I love about that one verse I can quote it right quick you know that even before the foundations of the earth you know God loved me God went to the cross God had already established the reality that what he was going to do to make things right he already knew what Adam was going to do well then why did you know why did God let Adam do it once again you said earlier you know he gives us the uh, the, the the we're free moral agents to to do why would God create a being to the, knowing that he would have the opportunity to not worship him or he can make the choice to not love God back. It, that The reality is the best way analogy I can give is my wife, Sandra. Sandra, I want her to tell me she loves me, not because I berate her or make her tell me. I want her to love me because she wants to love me. My wife loves me because she wants to, not because she's made to, not because she has to. She loves me because she wants to. The reality of that marriage is the same reality of that relationship between us and God. You know, that, that him being who he is and, and, and guiding us on our journeys and bringing us into the, the folding pattern of his fold. So, Bishop, I mean, I, I can't get more plainer than that. No, no, you can't. So you verse, eight, verse 18. Verse 18 says, one thing is for certain. There's no possible way that anyone could be neutral, uh, could be neutral, being neither in any way. We cannot, nor can anyone ride the fence. Every person on this planet has a master. It is either righteousness or sin, or sin. There's no in between. Since we have believed God, we now have a new master. As Christians, we are still able to sin, but we are no longer slaves to sin. We belong to God. We have been set free from the control of our evil desires and our selfish habits that seek to benefit ourselves alone. We are free to become enslaved to righteous living. Since we serve a righteous God looking forward with, with a blessed hope, God is transforming us to be like him in order for the glorious day we can share in the truest resurrected and eternal life. Mm -hmm. God is a greater master to have and to serve. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. I can't imagine, I, you know, um, I can't imagine not serving him. If I, I think about it, um, if I can give a quick testimony. So the other day, um, I was driving on the freeway, and it's a, it's a you know a, tw a twin lane freeway, and uh, all of a sudden, this this semi truck. I'm in the left lane, and this semi truck starts easing over into my lane. And, and I didn't hit him or anything, or he didn't hit me, but he just come over and I had to try to avoid him. Well, I, I, my, my left side of, the, of my truck went off the road enough that it took me, it just kind of just took over. And I went out into the medium of the freeway and I, I missed a covert, I, I know inches, I had to miss it by inches. And, um, and I, I just let God, and in my mind, I was prepared to die. I really was prepared to die. I was, I didn't think any, I wasn't scared. I wasn't nervous. I had this peace about me that just, I can't explain it. After it was over and, I, and, and, it, and everything got it back into control and I got everything stopped, I got mad. I actually got angry because I 
wanted to go home. I was excited to go home. The reason why I bring that as a testimony to our lesson tonight is because sin is not my master. Sin is not who enslaves me. I am a slave to Christ. I'm a slave to God. My sla if, if, if we think of slavery, okay, all right, Frank, you're a black man. You've lived through all kinds of things in your years, the 50s of when, you know, the, the dis the, all the disrespect that went on and, and, and stuff. I mean, you could tell stories, I'm sure, you know, we, we've heard the tales of the back of the bus and all this other kind of stuff and the different, you know, water fountains and all this, you know, I've heard you tell me stories about, you know, your, your young life and, and how that was very prevalent, you know, in those days. And, um, you know, because then that's, that's not right. None of that's right. Right. Okay. My point is, is that we think of slavery as in the civil war slavery. And then our minds transfer forward and we think of the 50s, you know, in the 60s when, 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 when segregation was so strong. So in, in, the, in the word of, of, of slavery, when I actually got angry because I didn't go to heaven, I, did, or I didn't go to the eternal, I didn't die. I, I, I mean, I'm ready to go. I don't know about anybody else. I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm good. I can go. I can stay. I'm good either way. I'm fine. And I, I, the idea, in fact, when I preach a funeral or, or if I go to or somebody dies or I know or a family member or something, I, I, I get jealous knowing that they're going to be with my Lord, our Lord. I, I get jealous in a way because I'm excited to be wherever he is. But then I have to, I come back, my feet gets planted back on the ground. I recognize that, you know, God's not through with me. That's fine too. To, to live is to, to, is to Christ, to die is to gain. I know what Paul meant. I know, I get it. But when we think of the word slavery, when I'm using that terminology tonight, when we're using it in our study, we often want to gravitate back into the time of the Civil War or segregation. So Frank, talk to us about slavery. Talk to us about the idea of how, why do we, why do we, you know, we think of it as such a negative term. Well, it all depends on how you look at it. Okay. Slavery, we know, is a means of control, believe it. We know that. True. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in Baltimore uh, in the late 40s, I'm a baby boomer, in the late 40s, we knew that there were two streets that divided the city. Charles Street divided east from west. Baltimore Street divided north from south. If you lived across North Avenue in a black neighborhood, you were somebody because black folk didn't go above North Avenue. You only found white folk up in that area. The, the uh, handlers and the uh, the uh, 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 people like that, the uh, uh, handlers uh, own uh, handlers ice cream. He lived up uh, up in the penthouse, up on handlers lane, and uh, he had uh, his own personal uh, coal yard. Everybody else had to buy coal. He had his own coal yard in the bottom of of the apartment house. Um, you knew what streets to go on, you knew where to go. And, to, and, and if you went downtown, you only went in certain stores because you didn't go in Holster Cones, you didn't go in Hustlers, you didn't go in uh, 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 Woolworths, uh, not to buy anything unless you had a note from the madam, because they weren't going to serve you. Oh, wow. You didn't try on no shoes, you didn't try on no hat, you didn't try on no clothes, you didn't, unless you had a note. Now, if you didn't have no note, then you had no business in the store in the first place. Because even though you had money, you couldn't afford their clothes. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a known fact. Brag or Gutman was the same thing. But eventually, over time, all of that changed. But 
you going downtown to buy what? No, you went over on the other side of town in the black neighborhood where they had the same thing, but it was cheaper. And the merchandise were cheaper. They so, didn't wait, they didn't last as long, but but you could get the same thing. So, so we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, allow ourselves to think of those aspects of slavery to 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 damage the idea of our being slave to Christ. Well, when you have preachers who stand up and tell you that if you don't do something, 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 so you're damned and you're going to hell. And this is what they preach you, hell and damnation. They indoctrinate you with this. They beat you up with the words. They intimidate you. And these are black preachers doing this because that's all they know. And I'm talking about doing, doing my boyhood day. And I'm just about 80 years old. And a lot of them old boys only had maybe a high school education if they had that. Now, one or two might have gone to the seminary, but those in the Methodist conference did not have a college education. Tell you that right now. Because there weren't that many black folk going to college. So why do we why do we allow the the mentality of the slavery aspect or segregation to somewhat damage the idea of being slave to Christ? Tradition. Okay. Black folk live by tradition and they'll die by it. That that's their sword. Hmm. How do we change that? Educate. Okay. Okay. Educate. So there is a characterization in regards to the idea of slavery. There is. There's a there stereotype too. All right. So I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you're bringing it like that because I want to bring bring real quickly the character of Christ versus Lucifer. Hmm. Okay. So to help you understand when we're talking about slavery. There is a, there is a, you're enslaved to something. We established that earlier, but there, just like that, there is a slavery to something that is a good thing as a, you know, versus the, the bad evil thing. The character of Christ reveals his true identity where the character of Lucifer makes his uh, 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 mask, his, excuse me, mask his, his true identity where Christ reveals it Lucifer will cover it up. The character of Christ is that he's never changing. True. But in the character of Lucifer, there's this dual or multiple type of identities. Okay. Um, in the character of Christ, it's 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 not beautiful in physical form. But in the character of Lucifer, it, he makes himself with physical beauty. Um, in the character of Christ, turns the other cheek. But in the character of Lucifer, he's bent on revenge. In the character of Christ, power comes from God. But in the character of Lucifer, power comes from self. And these are the aspects that we can look at to help us to understand what would we mean by slavery. So don't think of slavery as the old method or the old ideology or what you were taught what slavery was back in, in in your history class okay we're talking about just because a word is used doesn't mean it has negative content but just because a word is not used doesn't mean it doesn't it doesn't mean that it doesn't have negative content or that it doesn't have positive content the fact that the word is just a word the word slave is a word um the word word is a word. The word slave is a word. Now, what we do with it is on us. So I just want to kind of bring this to John the, also. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in scripture, uh, when, when you look at the Bible dictionary, it mentions slave, of, of such a false that I'm a slave to Christ, which meant he's a servant to Christ. Correct. So the word, Aaron, slavery, so the slavery terminology would be more of a servant terminology. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Moses' brother was a minister to him, and a minister is nothing but a servant. Mm. Mm. According to the Bible Dictionary and, and the way you read it, 
a minister is a servant. Yes. Because he serves, he serves the pastor's pleasure. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, we let's uh, let me ask you this, uh, Bishop. We we can break this up into tomorrow night on because really verses nineteen through twenty three is it's kind of a deep part of a lesson, and I don't want to want to, I want to um, be able to get us through this, but I do believe that I think that this would might be a good time that we could pause and pick up on tomorrow. That'll be that's fine um, because really verses nineteen through twenty three is talking about the security of our salvation the the reality that we have been set free from sin and are are now slaves to god or servants to god and this even th this is all part of of you know beginning in verse 15 all the way through 23 but th it's, it's not that he's changing uh focus it's that he is really bringing us into into focus of the fact of what slavery to or to be enslaved to God means or be enslaved to sin, what it means. Well, if that's the case, then, then tomorrow night, then you can uh, you can clarify clarify the statement, he whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. Amen. That's a good, yeah, we can do that. Absolutely. Um, I see uh, Jazra. Jazra's on. Hey, Jazra. She's, I know she's there. She's, yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's on mute. It's on mute. I, I sure would Jazzer, can you unmute your phone or your whichever way you're coming to us through? Well, she must be busy. Well, that's all right. Well, I prayed us in. I was going to see if she wanted to pray us out. God, that's a praying woman right there. Um, but uh, but anyway, I think I think this is a good time that we can we can do this. We can pick up tomorrow night on verse 19 and finish up 20 to 23. Okay. Um, but if you'd like to, uh, uh, any final comments, Frank, or, or before you, you press out too at the same time or whatever you want to do. Something, this is a subject that needs to be discussed. Mm. As I said, education is how we combat ignorance and uh, old wives' tales and bad false doctrine and things of this nature. You know, we have been put in a rut for so long in dogma until it can confuse you. And we are, you take dogma, Mr. Man, with tradition, and you got a grand mess. <laughs> you know, you've been scratching your head and you won't know who or what to believe. And you get to the point where a lot of people say, I'm not going to church because they're crazy. I don't believe <laughs> them in that craziness. No, they, they, no, uh-uh. I can, I can do bad by myself out here. Amen. So I'm glad that we were in this depth of study. I hope that those that are watching us and listening, listening to us on Zoom and Facebook are taking notes. I hope that they tell friends and they keep sharing this because this is vital. And we need, in, in times like these, yes. we need a savior. We, we, have, we, we have need of foundations because, I, 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 and it's not that I fear like out of, out of fear of being afraid. I say yeah. fear out of being concerned. Yeah. Um, I, I fear that, and I truly believe that the church does not know who she is. I think that we have, we've done so much ritualistically. We've done so, so much in, in pomp and circumstance. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we do things that is, you know, um, uh, extravagant regarding religion and how we conduct ourselves. You know, we do, we, you know, you know, we, we come to we come to a building at a certain time. And we got to make sure we get out at a certain time because my roast is in the oven, and and then in between there we got to make sure we you know we sing three songs and take up an offering, and the preacher can only preach you know thirty five minutes or whatever you know. I mean you know that we we've come to a point to where we're so religiously ritualistic that we have given credence to religion. And yeah, we 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 say we're worshiping the Lord, and and we can be. I'm not saying that you're not, but the fact is, and the fact remains, is that, you know, if God were to show up, and show out at a service, and 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 want to speak to us, from a prophetic standpoint, from a prophet standpoint, 
and a, and a prophet were to come on the scene and say, God has me here to say, and so, and so, and what could be the response? One of two things. Well, that's not on the agenda. That's not in our program. You know, we haven't decided for that. You got to go in front of the committee and then you got to go in front of the pastor and you got to do all this, you know, you got to do all that before, you know, you, you know, we, we got to set time. Well, we don't have time for that. No, my roast, I got, and I got a ball game to d- deal with at one o'clock. So I got to eat before that. And the church and the, and the restaurant's going to be awful packed. I got to go. I mean, you know, that's just, that's the aspect of what our, our, our religiosity has conformed us to. When I think, and the truth is, is that we should be, there's a term, free moral agents to let God decide what he wants done. Mm. instead of what we decide what we think should be done we 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 place more emphasis on you know the 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 tangible service yet you're not serving anything to anyone except a program 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 get your program you know i mean you know get you get you some popcorn and and a pop and a and a or a coca-cola or a drink or whatever and you know, you'd sit and watch the show, you know, and then you, you know, then you don't feel so bad when you got to pay for it, you know, put a little money in the plate that he's thrown in front of you, you know, and then, and, and we've, we've done this. We have made what we've done in my view, and you can, you can get mad at me, I guess. I don't know, but I think that we have actually mocked God in a, in a form of religion, denying the power thereof. Mm. I, I believe that we've we've conformed ourselves to an imagery instead of con, conform allowing our conformity to become the image. You know, the, we we should be windows to God, to everyone that's watching, everyone that looks into our life. We should be a window to the eternal. We should be a window to the aspect of what God is doing in the earth. We should be a window. And if there's ever a time that we need to understand truth, it's now. And I believe everything is being shook up for a reason. I believe Romans 12, when we finally get there, I think we're going to find out some prophetic viewpoints that Paul is going to express. And I think we're experiencing now, but we ain't got there yet. We're getting there. <laughs> but I mean, but, but um, I'm getting way ahead of me. I'm chattering. Brother, take us over. Take us prayer. Do, do what you got to do. Lord, take my hand. Mm. while I run this race Lord take my hand while I run this race Lord take my hand while I run this race and my running shall not have been in vain our God and our Father Lord we do thank you once more and again for allowing us to assemble ourselves together this evening and Father God, we ask that you bless all of those who tuned in by, via social media, be it Facebook or Zoom, and those that, that are here live. Continue, O oh God, to lead us and guide us and show us and teach us. Continue, O oh God, to look beyond our faults and see our needs. Continue, O oh God, to forgive us for our sins and forgive us, O oh God, for the things that we haven't done. Mm. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you are going to do. We're so blessed to have you as our Savior. Father God, give us traveling mercy as we leave your presence. Give those traveling mercy, O oh God, who are on the busy highways and byways. And unto keep us until we meet together again tomorrow night, until we meet again, may the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Share us on Facebook. Share among your friends. Put it on your page. Yeah, uh, because you know it's hey, <laughs> we're just all we're just showing we're just studying the word together. That's what we're doing. That's how we're doing, sir. Amen. Got them all night. Yep, seven thirty. Love you guys. Love you guys. See you, John. <laughs>